Thank you, Dr. Aznaki, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, a decade of STEMROS surveillance. Um, I've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to pick out a few highlights. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Um, I'm standing here, but I'm giving this talk on behalf of probably several hundred people who have contributed to the surveillance work. So many of you are in this room, and I'd just like to ac acknowledge all the inputs, you know, the assistance that you've, you've given. So this is your talk rather than my talk. So 2005 is where I'll start, and that, that was really the, the, the first steps in this, this story. So we'd had prior detection of UG99, TTKSK, so confirmed by Zach Pretorius. Um, it was quickly realized that a very large proportion of the world's wheat germplasm was susceptible to, to this race. There was an expert panel um, that was convened um, at the, the bidding of Dr. Borlaug, and that essentially led to the, the formation of the, the BGRI as we, we see it now. 2005, we did a first preliminary assessment, um, really back of the envelope, looking at major wind patterns, um, what we knew about where SR31 virulence was, was occurring, and just came up with our first initial ideas as to uh, where this thing might go and um, what sort of impact it might have. But out of all of this, there came a very clear need that we, we had to have effective monitoring and surveillance of, of the pathogens. So back then, in terms of what we knew, well, very little. We, we had maybe about 10 sites within East Africa. We knew there was SR31 virulence um, for stem rust. And what we needed to do at that point really was try and build up a surveillance network, get some eyes on the ground, get people doing surveys, um, people collecting samples, needed to track the important pathogens and critically inform the, the breeding programs as to, to what was happening. Needed to manage, disseminate information so people were, were in, informed about the changes that were, were going on. Um, improve impact assessments and also try and put some early warning systems in place. So this, this was kind of really our marching order. So I'll try and go through as to, you know, how far we've got against each, each of these things. So for the surveys, um, 2006, um, this is, the map shows wheat distribution. And essentially, we just, just had a few points on, on the map. Over time, and thanks to all your contributions, we've managed to push it out. So we're now covering quite a large proportion of, of the wheat areas, certainly a large proportion of the developing world wheat areas. Around about 21,000 plus, and increasing all the time, records in, in the database, 35 plus countries. And I think I don't know of a similar system that's as comprehensive in terms of, of coverage and, and what it's doing for another major crop disease. So I think we've, we've got the system that is the most comprehensive. We've been able to bring in some tools to help us with the surveys. Um, I mean, early on, we set up a, a standardized way of, of doing surveys so we could compare results across different countries. Technology is now beginning to help us. So thanks to links with uh, Sathguru, Hananth, his, his group, being able to develop. We've now got a, a tablet app for the surveys, makes it quick and easy to collect data in the field. But critically, it means that we can get data from the field into the database in almost real, real time. So if you're looking at early warning, then these sort of things are really, really useful. In terms of managing the data, um, we've had a great collaboration with Mogens Group in, in Denmark, Global Rust Reference Center. Put together something we call the Wheat Rust Toolbox. 
So really, this is a fully comprehensive data management system. It allows us to set different levels of access for different users. So people from a certain country can see their own country data. Other people can see a broader set of countries. It allows us to import data into the system. So we can have the, the tablets, the smartphones, data coming into the system. We've also got online data entry. And then there's a whole suite of um, display tools and options that we, we can export data into to different systems. So it's, it's a very flexible system. And the databases that underpin this, it's also very flexible. So they're handling the survey data, pathotype data. We've got trap nursery data in there. We've got Barbary survey information in there. And we're also beginning to bring in the molecular information as, as well. And it's generic. It's applicable for all the rusts. And we're also looking to expand this out to, to other crops, other diseases. So in terms of the, the framework, the, the, the IT be behind it, how it's all put together, um, as I say, the main point here is that it's a very flexible system. And the, the outputs we can basically embed in, in essentially any web, web portal. Um, so there's a few examples here that all of those different websites are being fed information from a one one data management system. So there's a range of, of, of interactive tools, and um, we're, we're putting those into, into different outlets. So got here the, the CIMIT Rust Tracker site, and then Global Rust Reference Center, wheatrust.org. It's the same tools appearing in, in both sites. They're, they're in a different shell, but it's the same tools. And also the way the development is being done, that it's the same tools, whether it's stem rust or stripe rust. So if Mogan's group develop a new tool for, for stripe rust, it's automatically available for stem rust and, and vice versa. So it's, it's, we're trying to be very efficient with the way this thing's been developed. The public sort of access points. So this is just flagging one. This is our Rust Tracker site. So what we tried to do here was have a, a single source of up-to-date information for the global Rust monitoring activities. It's directly connected to the toolbox. So we've got interactive tools that, once they're validated in the database, then they're automatically updated within the public information systems. And we're also connecting other information sets into these. So this whole notion of integrated information resources. So we've got pathogen databases. So that's largely managed by the, the wheat rust toolbox. We've also got host databases. So within, within CIMIT um, and other organizations, we've, we've got information on the host. So we use the web portal just as a way to integrate. You can get at both sets of information from a single portal. That's the idea. And then you get pathogen information products, and there's also host information products. We're not quite there yet, but we're working towards connecting more the pathogen and the, the host information products together. So that's, that's something we're working on now, and we, we need to do a better job on that. But we're getting, getting there with this in integrator. We can't just have one set of information with, without the other. OK, switching the pathotyping capacity. So throughout the last 10 years, we've, we've seen you know, a, a very needed increase in, in pathotyping capacity, both in terms of infrastructure and also human capacity. We've seen improvements international level, so we've, we've got a set of, of really key labs that are really supporting all, all of these efforts. USDA, Cereals Disease Lab, Minnesota, Tom Fetcher's lab, AAFC, um, Canada, and Mogan's group, Global Rust Reference Center in, in Denmark. We'll, additionally, there's, there's, there's regional labs. So Zach Pretorius's lab in South Africa for the Southern Africa region. Dr. Bardwash's lab in, in Shimla, 
serv serving the, the South Asia region. And we're also, with the work Kumas is doing, the Carter Lab in, in Izmir, this is hopefully going to be coming online soon. But I think really critical, and, and Bob highlighted this in his talk, that we, we need increased national capacity. And we're seeing some good, good progress. I'm flagging um, EIR, the lab at Ambo in Ethiopia. You see the photos here. It's gone from greenhouse construction now to fully functional um, pathotyping lab. It's great. I mean, it's a fantastic success story, and I really appreciate the, the work that the people have put into making that happen. Similarly, in Turkey, we've seen improvements. Zafar's lab there, and uh, Javed in, in Pakistan, Murray, really great improvements in, in that capacity as well. Kenya, we're hoping that's going to come, come on board as, as well soon. So I think there's some very encouraging things happening. There's more to be done, but, but things are happening. With that increased pathotyping capacity, um, we've been able to successfully track in, important races, race groups. So I'll, I'll flag the UG99 race group. So basically, this, this is where we started. Um, 2005, we knew we had um, two races within the UG99 um, race group. Over the years, we've been able to, to track the changes and the, the distribution, and I think we've done this very successfully. We've now got 11 confirmed races within the UG99 race group. They've been confirmed in 13 countries, essentially north to south in Africa, but then also spreading Yemen and Iran. We've seen the acquisition of virulence to genes like SR24, 36, 9H, and most recently TMP. We saw three new variants of UG99 detected in Kenya last year, two of them being virulent on TMP. One of those new variants, TTKTT, TTK, sorry, which is UG99 plus TMP, it was also detected in Uganda, Rwanda, Eritrea, and Egypt, all within the, the same, same year. So that's, that's a pretty big distribution. I mean, one factor is that, yes, we, our system is probably working. We've been able to pick, pick this up. But I suspect it is a very real, rapid spread of this, this new, new race. And I think the future, we're going to see more new races come up, and we're going to see increasing spread geographically. So switching away from UG99, Digaloo race, TKTTF. So Ethiopia, 2013, I'll flag this as, I don't know, I put failure and success. So there's a crop of digaloo in Ethiopia. It's completely destroyed by, by stem rust, by this, this race. And there were tens of thousands of hectares that looked exactly like, like this. So this race, it's not, it's not in the UG99 ra race group. It's virulent on TMP. And almost most likely, it was an incursion into Ethiopia from, from the Middle East region. That's our, our best guess. So the failure was we missed seeing the, the threat. We, we didn't pick it. Basically, it caused no problems in, in other countries. It's been known in, in Turkey, other countries, since at least 2005. It's never caused any, any damage in, in any of the countries. We certainly, I think, had an imperfect knowledge of the, the resistance genes that were in the predominant Ethiopian cultivars. We should have had better, better knowledge. And we also had a lack of knowledge in terms of the importance of migration into Africa. We'd picked up on possibilities of moving out of Africa, but I think we'd, we'd missed the ball in terms of things coming the other way. And we'll, our knowledge is improving, and you'll hear more about this later with Marcel's talk. But I, I will add on to this that just the, the, the time scale. I mean, okay, we, we missed it, but 
basically the first indication we had there was a problem was in mid-October 2013. Within a month, we had a full-blown epidemic raging. It, it just happened so, so quickly once, once this had come in. I mean, we went back and we subsequently found one single sample from the, the previous year. But it, it really was a, a fast event. But there was also, I think, success, a learning experience from what we saw with the Digaloo race. We got really rapid de detection and identification as what, what was the causal race, what was the problem within the, within the season. And I think it was, a, it was an outstanding global collaboration. There's a paper just, just come out in um, phytopathology. I think there's over 20 authors on the paper representing multiple institutions from, from all around the world that came together and worked, worked on this, this problem. We saw germplasm screening that was started almost immediately in response to this, this new race, both seedling tests but also adult plant. I mean, we heard from Matt earlier about single race nurseries that they're running in, in the US. We now have single race nurseries up and running in Ethiopia with the four predominant key races that, that we have in the country. So the, the germplasm is being screened against, against these key races. Also, the Digaloo race was really a catalyst for, for advanced early warning um, systems, linking in the spore dispersal modeling. This was real, a real driver to push, push this work. And really, none of this, this response, everything happening so quickly, would have been possible without the investments around the UG99 uh, event. So it's, yeah, those investments are now valuable for other, other races that are important. Okay, Barbary. Barbary in East Africa, we're seeing some exciting new discoveries com coming up. So the species that we have in East Africa, um, Holstei, we know from um, greenhouse work that it's susceptible to both PGT and P PST, but we had no previous knowledge on its potential role as an alternate host in natural conditions in, in Africa. Barbary sites have been located in Kenya and Ethiopia, and huge credit to Ruth and her team in, in Kenya, Dr. Gatana and Deli, the team at Ambo in, in Ethiopia. Just finding these sites is, is quite a challenge, yeah? So, each all samples from Ethiopia, 2012, 2014, now had successful um, stem rust infections wheat, line E, barley, um, high proli, and rye prolific, so confirmed across dif different labs, the same, same results. We don't know the former specialis, but definitely P, P. graminis completes its, its sexual cycle in Ethiopia. So Melissa, she has a poster up here, you can read more about this work. But just to show you the challenges for trying to find these sites. So Ruth and her team have turned into mountaineers. They've been climbing volcanoes in the Rift Valley to search for Barbary. Team in, in Ethiopia, I think they found one, one plant. They took a cutting and then they were basically stopping every farmer along the road for several hundred kilometers saying, have you seen this, this plant? And then after asking hundreds and hundreds of farmers, they found maybe 20 farmers who said, yeah, I know this plant. And off you'd go hiking off, way off the road and down gorges and up mountainsides. And then eventually, yeah, you would, you would, you would find the plant. So it, just finding these sites has been amazing. And I really credit the, the teams in Kenya and Ethiopia for the work they've put in to, to do this. Okay, switching on, molecular diagnostics, population gen genetics. Dr. Les Sabo, um, USDA, the Serious Disease Lab has been, been the champion behind this and done some incredible work to advance this. So the work that Les, his group have done, put together um, a SNP assay um, for the UG99 
race, race group is a two-stage assay. Stage one says yes or no, it's, it's UG99 race group. Stage two then identifies most of the, the key races within the UG99 race group. It's, it's very quick, it's very fast, it's, it's reliable, it's, it's, it's a great tool. Les has also put together two um, high throughput genotyping SNP chips for studying population genetics. So he's got a 1.5K chip and a 3K chip. Um, these working with a variety of different samples. So on the side here, a lot of them are, are field collected single postules that we kill in ethanol and then we, we send off to Les and there's no permits needed for these. So it's, it's a great, great system. Example, the phylogenetic analysis. So these are um, samples from Ethiopia, from the, the, the epidemic. And you see clearly um, there's, there's four clades and basically those clades match, match the four races, the four race groups that we, we have in, e, in Ethiopia. You see that TKTTF, it's very distinct from the UG99 race group, very different. But also, there are two subclades within that, that same race phenotype. We've got what Les calls an A, a subclade and a B subclade. We don't know what that means, but certainly the B subclade is the one that now is, is taking off and pr predominating. So it's, it's got something, some advantage compared to, to the, the A subclade, certainly in Ethiopia. Okay, the emerging early warning systems. So the pretty colored picture you see here, it's an example of um, spore dispersal deposition modeling. This has been done co in co collaboration with um, Chris Gilligan's work at Cambridge University, but then also linked into the UK Met Office. And again, it's another wonderful collaboration so this was the 2013 epidemic, and this shows the, the predicted spore dispersal from the core of the epidemic in November 2013. The green dots are essentially where the field observations were of Digaloo being taken out by, by this race. So there's very good correlation between what we see in the field and what the, the model was, was predicting. This work is also continuing, and you'll hear more about it from Marcel a little bit later, quantifying the, the spore migration pathways. So you'll see we're now building up a very good picture of which are the most likely routes that, that spores are likely to move around on a, on a regional cross-continental basis. We're also, like, feeding this stuff into real world applications. So this, within Ethiopia, we're working with the colleagues there to put together um, an early warning system. So the idea behind this is that we have field surveys being done. With the tablets, we can get information in pretty much near real time. We also want to get the extension people set up with a very simple SMS system. So we want to crowdsource disease. So get lots of reports very frequently saying disease is, is coming up here. Feed this into a central unit that would be housed within EIAR. So with uh, Dr. Aznaki's support, Dr. Dr. Fantoon. This information then being linked into the advanced modeling. So we know instantly where disease is is breaking out, that feeds into the model. The model then gives us a seven to day four, 10, 10 day forecast as to where the spores are gonna be, where environmental suitability is coming up, and we can identify the areas of highest risk. Feed that information back to the ministry, to the extension people. We can get you know scouting, we can hopefully get control done in time on farmers' farmers fields, and we hopefully can be ahead of, of, of the disease. So we're not there yet, but it's, it's things are, are, are moving forward. And just, just an update, so um, within Ethiopia, we have um, 
ATA, Agricultural Transformation Agency, um, and they, together with the, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, they put together a, a formal plan for Ross early warning and surveillance, incorporating many of the ideas I, I just, just put up. It's gone through extensive consultation and it's literally just gone to, to the minister for his, his endorsement and approval. And I, I think this will be, be forthcoming. So these, these things are, it's beginning to, to take shape, which I, I think is, is great. I think it's very positive. Um, and also the, the spore dispersal work from Cambridge. I mean, we're still, you know, the, the testing validation phase, but we're starting to look at these and use, you know, helpers this season within Ethiopia, like take this information and then guide where we, you know, where control should be happening, where people should be, should be looking. So just to finish off with, I think we've made some advances, yeah? I think without any doubt, I mean, we've, we've probably got one of the most comprehensive operational monitoring systems for a major crop, crop disease. The UG99 investments and the learning, it's, it's now, it's, we're still applying it to UG99, obviously, but it's, it's now been applied for other important races and also other, other rusts. We're seeing, you know, new races are, are continuing to, to, to come up, yeah? And there's going to be future incursions into, into new areas. Um, I think we've really got to have long-term effective monitoring, um, sharing of information, and also the connections to the, to the breeding programs. We can't just, just let this, this stop. New technologies, they're certainly playing a role. The molecular diagnostics, the dispersal, the epidemiological modeling. Um, we haven't started using remote sensing yet, but I'm interested in, in at least having a look, see what possibilities exist there. But we're always going to need good field pathology, yeah? We, the technologies can help us, but we've, we've still got to have good pathologists on, on the ground. There's still, you know, there's many gaps and challenges. We've improved race analysis capacity, I think, but there's more to be done. Um, other rusts, other diseases, I mean, we're picking up more on, on yellow rust, but we need to do more. A true understanding of the role of Barbary. I mean, we're, we're making some progress, but there's still more, a lot more to learn, I think. And also the whole long-term sustainability of the, the, the system, yeah? It's not something you can do for like, you know, five years, 10 years, this should be there for the, for the duration, because these threats are gonna keep, keep popping up, there'll be different threats emerging. So with that, I'd like to thank many, many people, many institutions around the world. I mean, it's been an incredible collaborative effort, um, and I think that's, that's why it's, it's worked, basically. Um, Donors, I've, I've highlighted, I mean, without their support, we could, we could do nothing. But then the contributions from so many institutions and then national programs in over 30 countries. I mean, I don't have enough room on slides to, to put everybody up there. So I apologize for any omissions, but I'd just like to thank everybody who's contributed.